Myself, I'm Fran from Environment Trust. I'm the Nature Conservation Manager, and I think the rest of the team are going to in, um, in, introduce themselves. Um, Kate, and if you want to introduce yourself, you are unmuted. Hi, uh, I'm Kate Slack. I'm the head gardener at Marble Hill Park, so I oversee the restoration of the gardens and will be looking after them when it's all finished. Lovely. And John? Uh, hi, I'm, my name is John. Um, I'm one of the park rangers here at Marble Hill and I look after the bees in our small bee bakery. Fantastic. My name is Rachel Morrison. I'm the audience development manager at Marble Hill. Fantastic. And Stephen? I'm S Stephen James. I work at Environment Trust with Fran and I'm starting the first bit of the presentation, which is just setting the scene, really. Lovely. So I'm just going to start the presentation. Okay. That's great. So we're at Environment Trust working with English Heritage in partnership on a range of activities at Marble Hill as part of Marble Hill Revived and that's why we're working together today and uh, welcome everybody. Next. So today we'll be uh, hearing a little bit about Environment Trust and Marble Hill Revived as projects to set the scene but then we'll be hearing in a lot more detail about these pollinators in decline, what's happening at Marble Hill and there'll be some instructions for making a bee nursery or a little bee hotel at home for ourselves, which will be fun. Next, please. About Environment Trust, working, we're, um, we're a local charity working in Southwest London for the last 30 years on nature conservation. Um, you can see from some of the pictures here, actually in one of those with the blue t-shirts, they're um, restoring a bee bank there. And we also look after historic buildings, Grove Gardens Chapel, Kilmory Mausoleum, uh, in various ways. And um, that's us. Next, please. Um, this is why we're really excited about working with the Environment Trust, who do a great job around um, around the southwest London. Um, but we we. Uh, providing Marble Hill Revive, which is a really exciting um, opportunity um, uh, with a £6 million um, investment in our local park. And that will mean that the house is reinterpreted um, and open for five days a week for free, which will be a really, really magic opportunity for heritage to be really embedded within our local uh, community. Um, also, that, that house is going to be reinterpreted in a way where all the senses are going to be explored. Everything from having a soundscape to a smellscape. So um, hopefully this will be a place that you'd like to come to again and again um, to, um, to relive that history that um, is our heritage and, and belongs to us. And part of that is about a, this improved landscape. Um, we're doing lots of work at the moment under the amazing um, uh, leadership of Kate, who you're going to hear um, about uh, later on. Um, Kate, along with an army of amazing volunteers, um, our super rangers, um, and also um, her horticultural apprentice, Jack, um, are really making huge headway in terms of making sure that the landscape is really invested in. And Kate's role will li live long beyond the Marble Hill Revived um, project. And so biodiversity, the importance of nature, the wonderful bees on site will be something that is just um, is here to stay. And that's really lovely. And the whole raft of exciting events are being planned. And this is why we're here today. So we're really excited that you're part of this Marble Hill revival. Um, but it's not just about all the wonderful landscape and ecology. We're really hoping that um, everything from the sports pitches and the sports nets the, uh, uh, is going to be um, invested in. So that these are really important resources for our community that are here to stay. Um, and as part of that, there's going to be a changing facility, which is accessible um, and also can have the opportunity for women to do sports as well. Hurrah! Um, we're going to have a lovely, lovely cafe. Um, and whenever you have a cup of coffee, you'll be investing in the park and the house because that's being brought in house. Um, and it will still be within the same footprint, but will mean that there's, uh, you know, kind of you can have a lovely cup of tea while you're watching um, your little ones play or you can do some free yoga on site and then go and warm the cockles of your heart with a nice hearty soup made from 
the fruit and veg, well, the, uh, the, sorry, the veg, obviously, if it's soup, uh, the veg that is uh, being um, grown so beautifully by our um, kitchen garden volunteers on site. There's a load of new jobs um, and uh, refreshed park signage and seating and bins and things on site too. Um, and we're really excited about working with active local partners and that includes the mm. Environment Trust, as well as a whole raft of um, uh, people uh, who are local to us. And that's everything from working with abused women with Dose of Nature um, to working with lots of um, hearing charities to share about Henrietta and her hearing loss. And so that we can really um, make sure that, that house is interpreted in a sensitive kind of way. So we're excited about the revival and we're really excited that you're here being part of that revival uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thanks Rachel. Next. And we've worked together on a, a lot of activities. Obviously all of these photos are from a previous year, but perhaps a happier time when we could crowd together more closely. We're doing a lot more activities of the current style but you see art picnics and tours and gardening sessions and so on. But we'll get onto the main meat of the day, which is all about bees. Next. Lovely. So this is where you guys get involved. I've got a quick question for everyone. So remember just once it comes up and okay. And one second. Ooh. There we go. There we go. So if you just oh, question, I'll, I'll read it out. Question one, how many bee species are there in the UK? There are two questions. And the second question, approximately what percentage of these species are solitary bees rather than living in hives? And you can just click the answer and then press submit. And when everyone's had a chance to do that, I must admit, I don't know the answer to either of those questions questions so I had to guess I don't know about anybody else but let's see okay let's see how the results are coming through has everyone had a chance okay well how many bee species in the UK most people thought there were 270 and uh, approximately what percentage of these bees are solitary bees um, most people 75 percent people thought that a quarter of them okay. were although okay. some so it's Fran tell us about it Yes, so you are indeed right. Anyone who said 270, there are 270 species of bee in the UK, but approximately about 250 of those are the solitary bees. So we're looking at the 92% so that actually there's many, many more solitary bees than you might think. So let's find out a little bit about them. You can just click close. That's it, so just click close. So we have obviously our three different types. We have the bumblebees and the honeybees that you guys are probably more familiar with. And then there's actually a lot of solitary bees and they are really diverse in, in how they look and what they do. Um, but we'll talk about a few of those. So we have some of our bumblebees here, and these are some really lovely identification guys of the ones you might see. So one of the most common ones you might see is this white-tailed, the banded white-tailed bumblebee here, and distinctive because of its white tail, surprisingly enough. So it looks pretty much like a sort of standard bumblebee with the black and yellow bands that you might expect with this yellow tail. Now they can be seen from about March to November time and they like to create their sort of their nesting habits in old burrows and in cavities. Then we have the brown cardaby over here or also the common cardaby as well and they are the more browny looking bumblebees and the most common one of that is the common bumblebee, uh, the common cardaby, excuse me. And then over here we have the red tailed black bumblebees and the male can be distinguished from the female with this golden or yellow ruff around its neck here but they have this orangey red bottom of its of its abdomen here and then we have the early bumblebee and Funnily enough, they come out much earlier and are around for, sort of from as maybe as early as February, if the weather's right. And they tend to um, stop being around by about the June time, where most of these are still around into sort of October, November time. So we're getting to the end of our bumblebees um, sort of foraging and, and, and time that they're out. 
And then we have the tree bumblebee, the distinctive black markings with this ginger thorax up here, this middle part of the bee, and the hairy legs. So we have all of that. And these guys, funny enough, they tend to live in trees. They like to make their nests in cavities of trees. And then, oh, and then we'll go back. The honeybee here, we only have one species of honeybee in the UK, um, so they're pretty unique to identify them, you see here, but um, I'll leave the honeybee to John later because he's going to tell you lots more about those. And then we have the solitary bee. So what are solitary bees? Well, the name kind of gives it away. These guys, they don't live in hives like the honeybees. They don't live together in air, in nests like the bumblebees. These guys live alone. They spend most of their life alone. And they tend to fly around and they still do collect, um, they still do feed on, on nectar in the same way and, and use the pollen. But actually what they do is they have different nesting habitats. So some of them will actually burrow out spaces in the ground and some of them will use pre-hollowed tubes and holes and pre so maybe beetles nests that they'll repurpose and the females are the ones that do this so they build their nests and they have really impressive ways of sort of doing things so what they'll do is they'll excavate their hole or maybe find a hole and then they will build their nest, they'll add pollen and maybe a bit of nectar to give sustenance to their eggs. They'll then lay their eggs and they'll lay all of their female eggs at the back and then all of their male eggs at the front. And they do this because the male eggs, they take about two weeks less to get ready. So they come out and then two weeks later, all the female um, bees will also then come out. And then to keep them safe across the winter, they like to seal up the ends of these holes in the ground or the tubes. And actually by what they seal up, you can tell what type of bee it might be. So here we have some different options here. So we have this one here in the middle that looks like it's got some sort of masticate, masticated, chewed up leaves in it. That's probably the leaf cutter bee. So what they like to do is they take bits of leaf and chunks of bee and they, they chew it up and mash it up and they use that to seal. And then others, maybe like the red mason bee, they like to use mud to seal up their holes. Now the red mason bee is probably the most common bee you'll see in terms of solitary um, around in the UK. It is definitely the most abundant. And then others use a bit of a mix. They use a mix of pollen and nectar and mud and whatever they can find to seal up. So this is this one here, this weird sort of orangey mix of pollen and mud and all sorts of things to keep them nice and safe. Now we'll come on to a little bit more about how you guys can create one of these for yourself later. But first, we're going to talk about sort of why it's so important to support our bees. So in the UK, we've actually lost about a third of all of our bees. A third of our species are in decline. And what that actually means is for every kilometre squared, we've lost 11 species of bee in the UK. Now our table here actually shows where that's most in, uh, sort of most impactful. So actually the widespread species, the species that aren't sort of captured to one area up the top here, we have those and we've seen a real radical drop in those. And those that are focused in the south over here. So those widespread southern species have seen this dramatic drop as well. And this, I'll just give you a little uh, breakdown here. This is a one kilometer grid cell. So each one of these is that one kilometer that I was talking about, that drop of 11 species. So this is just this showing this, but why is that happening? Well, there's many reasons. Environmental pollution is a big one. So all of the sort of the air pollutants that we hear about, they are a big impact on bees. Climate change, obviously the changing of temperatures, the different areas that bees are actually able to occupy invasive species forcing out um, the different bees but also invasive species in plants and bees not register them as being able to accept pollen or plants that maybe don't produce the right amount of pollen or aren't as acceptable or uh, accessible to bees also the use of pesticide and different intensive farming management techniques but also in habitats where they're becoming less and less connected so bees 
as we know, like to travel far from their hives or from their nests or, or search for pollen and different things like that. And what they need to do that is they need a connected corridor. They need to be able to move from one space to the other. But through our urbanization, especially in our city locations, that's getting harder and harder. There's less appropriate habitat and less appropriate feeding uh, sites for these bees. So they're really, really struggling. So one of the things Environment Trust is doing is we're working on this project called Green Hubs. Now that is all about creating this stepping stone effect for bee connectivity but also other pollinators and other wildlife. All wildlife needs this connectivity to be able to move through sites. So in this Green Hub project we're creating many more mini meadows, we're planting um, lots of um, spring flowering bulbs, we're increasing the tree cover especially in fruit trees to add lots and lots of opportunities for, for pollen gathering by these bees. So this is sort of how we're helping but we'll come on to a little bit more about how you can help in your home later on. But now I'm going to pass on to John, who's disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Fantastic. But in the meantime, we'll get you thinking because we've got another poll. Oh, I'm still sharing that. And we're going to move on to the poll. And this one is all about honey. Great. So, Brand, yeah. we have uh, our second question. How much honey can a single beehive produce each year? We can have one of these choices. Okay, we've got just a couple of seconds to think about that and then submit. What's a plausible answer? Right. Okay, has everyone had a chance to do that? Let's have a look. How much honey can a single hive produce each year? Well, about half the people, I have to say, I ticked five kilograms and about half the people here did as well. Some others thought it was going to be much more, a couple of people thought it was going to be 112 ki kilograms, but five is the most popular answer. What's the answer, Fran? Okay, fantastic. Well, it's a little bit of a trick answer because actually there's two answers that would have been um, classified as correct. So on a standard year, it's about 11 kilograms that each hive can produce. But on a really good year, they can produce up to about 27 kilograms per hive, which is a really impressive amount. Now, John is going to tell you a little bit more about um, our hives, but I think he might have just dropped out. So there we go. Let me just close this. So remember to close your poll so you can see. So I don't know if Kate, you want to give a bit of background to the hive. Um, yes, I can talk through a bit what John is going to talk about. Um, so this is a photo of Marble Hill House. Um, and when John initially started as a ranger, they didn't have any big hives at Marble Hill Park. Um, and, uh, himself and a couple of the other rangers thought it would be a really nice link between the history of the house and the landscape to introduce beehives to Marble Hill Park. Um, partly this is because historically they would have had beehives at Marble Hill Park because it, that was one of the main ways in those days that they had uh, any kind of sweet um, uh, sweeteners in their um, diet. Um, Although what they would have done in those days would have actually, they had the hive, but they would have had to kill the bees in order to get the honey because they didn't have the, the modern hive that we have where we can take out, slide out the frames. Um, but that over the years, they have managed to um, create hives where we don't actually have to kill the bees. Um, this is a little um, a photograph of John and his beehive. Um, and some of the frames that he uses. Ah, there you go, Hi. John. You want to talk through this slide? Uh, welcome Hi. back. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, my connection went off and I got completely disconnected there and it's just come back on again. So apologies for that. Um, so we've just done a very brief um, overview, um, Kate has, about why the hives uh, were at Marble Hill and also about sort of have, how they had to be deconstructed and, and, and the bees killed oh, okay. for, yeah, for that's, the bees. That, that's a quick uh, little glimpse there of the uh, apiary here at Marble Hill. Um, and that's some of the frames there, um, so which helps us take the hives apart. We can dismantle it, we can put it back together. Um, as one of the sort of interesting sort of historical points to it is that the original hives that would have been there at Marble Hill, they were obviously quite different from these modern hives. Um, 
you had to basically destroy most of the hive at the end of the season to take the honey out. So um, our modern day equivalents are quite different. Um, they're all well organized. You can pull them out, we can extract the honey um, and we can put it all back together again, basically. Um, and that is there, it's just a little, little snippet there of, of being out in the apiary. Have you got another slide there? Can yeah, that's a bit more. That's they. That is a nice picture there. That is the sort of open uh, brood, really. That is a very healthy-looking hive there. Um, you have it's covered in bees. It, the yellow wax underneath it is it's a wax capping, and underneath those cappings is the is the is the next generation of bees, really, that will be coming out. Um, they will be coming out. They'll be in that in those little. Uh, in their larva there for about 10 days or so. And those bees there on the outside will be feeding them and looking after them. And then the bees will go through the rest of their life cycle, which is about spending a week in the hive, um, another, another week or so going out and foraging and bringing back nectar into the hives. So, um, so yeah, and that's what, um, has comes out of it all really. That's um, a picture of some of our honey that we've taken out. Um, probably took about 90 to 100 pounds of honey out uh, this year. Um, so yeah, one of those hives probably did about 80 pounds and the other two hives, 10 or so each. Um, it's a quite an interesting way to, to it's been interesting for us just the idea of producing honey and seeing where it comes from um, and just having that experience of, 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 of making some local food production. Um, I think we've all found that quite interesting and we've often wondered about the honey. It's a shame what we, something we can't do on a Zoom link is actually taste it, but if you could taste the honey, um, it's, it's quite, it has a very interesting taste and obviously coming from all the different flora that we have down at Marble Hill, particularly the lime trees, the chestnut trees, um, and possibly a lot of blackberry we have there. But it's a very interesting taste and it's a shame you, you, you all can't taste it really. Um, uh, I don't know if you got that slot with that picture of the house, you had a slight, yep. oh that's, oh yeah. Okay. Right, there's one there in the main house there, yeah. Um, we, we sort of had the idea, the idea of establishing um, the, 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 uh, the hides at Marble Hill. Um, we wanted to kind of do it really because historically we knew that there were hides there. So it, it was quite kind of interesting to see if we could re-establish them here. Um, that's also helped us make, make a bit of a link between the house and the grounds. Um, People often come to the park and they don't realize it's a historic pro property. They don't even know about the house and they don't realize what's inside of it. So we kind of thought that if we, we had the idea that if people visiting the house saw honey for sale in the shop, um, it would get them interested in the landscape and sort of help increase awareness of the wildlife around in the park. And also just generally that historical significance of Marble Hill. And I think, I think in some ways we've been sort of able to do that, but um, it, it, it's an ongoing process and it's been a very interesting thing working and, and establishing the hives and just following the life cycle of the bees. I know it's a, it's a particularly sort of different life cycle that the honeybees have because the, 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 the hives stay alive all year round. They have summer bees and now we've got the winter bees that, that live for three or four months and they carry the hive through the winter. Um, but generally bees through the summer from the spring onwards, they only live for three weeks. So it was quite a difference in their life cycle, but it's been fascinating following all that and working with it and being able to come up with those really delicious jars of honey and to taste them and, and to think about, wow, you know, where, where does that come from? So, um, We've gone back here, yeah, and that's. I think we had a little video clip actually of some. I don't know. Have you played the video? I was, Not yeah, yet. That's, yeah. Okay. That's. So, having looked, seen all that delicious honey that we that I have taken out, I am actually now I'm putting it back in again. So we take the honey out. You, you 
pretty much straight away got to replace it, you know, because this is what's going to get bees through through the through through the winter, um, and it might look a little bit bad. You're taking all that honey and you're only putting back sugar water, but they bees live just as well off sugar water as they do off honey, and they'd be perfectly fine getting them through the winter. It's just important that as a beekeeper, you get it back in the hive as fast as possible. So there I am, just filled that up with some sugar um, syrup, going into one of the hives there. I'm going to place it in the top of it. Look. And just showing you how that, as a contact feeder, how that works. We tip it upside down. It's a little suction there, so the water, it, it doesn't come out. The bees go onto that little mesh there, and they can just feed straight away, take it down into the hives where they'll need it. They, they treat it like a nectar, basically. They convert it into a honey, um, which is basically taking all the water out of it. They lower the water content and they turn it into a honey, wax it over. So they've got their supplies for the winter. And that's what one of the hives there. We've got three there and that's in our little apiary and I'm just putting it in the hive there. Um, you can see there, there's not a lot of bees coming out. They, they are very gentle bees that we have there at the moment. Um, they're, they're very calm, very easy to work with. Um, and bees are not, honey bees are not always like that. They can be quite difficult to work with, but these are really lovely bees to work with. And I think uh, the person shooting the video there, can be, which was Rachel, um, I think she'd be a testament to that because she was just literally just standing there without a bee veil on, but it, they were very relaxed. Yeah. Um, and that's our the sort of main hive we've got here. Um, that's the one that really most of the honey came out of. Um, and I've just put in some more food there. Uh, I think that was the last one that I had, had, had to feed. Um, but you'll notice that they're right up against the wall there. I keep them quite close to the wall. So when the bees come out of the hive, they have to go up quite high and it keeps them out of the way of people. They tend to fly very high and then they come down low into the hive. So I, they're not gonna disturb anyone basically. But yeah, that's, so that's basically our apiary there, three hives. Um, they're all pretty much set for the winter. They've had, um, we've taken the honey out and we've fed them up hopefully and they're gonna get through the winter. Fantastic, thanks John. So now we're gonna get you guys back involved again with our next question. Um, so there we go. We have two questions here. What color of flowers do bees prefer? And the second question, why is that their preference? So we've got some choices, one from each question and uh, we'll a couple of minutes to do that. And we've clicked it submit. Okay, we've had a couple of seconds to think about that. Very interesting question. And three quarters of people, what color of flowers do these prefer? Three quarters of people chose purple as the favorite color. And the reason that most people think is that it means the bees can see them better. Fantastic, and you'd be absolutely right. Um, so purple is indeed um, sort of the more pref preferred uh, flower or color of the bees, but actually it doesn't mean they don't like the others. They, they do like all the others, but they can see them better. And the reason that is, is because they can actually see in ultraviolet light. So the purple stands out much clearer to them. Whereas for example, the red is much harder for them to see. So that's why they have that preference, fantastic. So now I'm gonna pass over to Kate. She's gonna tell you a bit about what they're doing at Marble Hill. Um, hi, so yeah, but we're very much planting um, in the project with bees and other pollinators in mind. So we are planting uh, over 12,000 newly planted um, flowers, shrubs and trees. Um, there's uh, 112 uh, new species that are being introduced to the parkland. So these are species that were not previously in the park or the gardens before the project. Um, and we, the idea is to have 
plants flowering from February to October. So it will be quite interesting to see if, if these, uh, the introduction of so many different flowering species makes a difference to the taste of John's honey because previously uh, the bees were more reliant on the trees, the flowers from the trees. So it will be interesting to see if it changes the taste of the honey. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please, Sam. Oh, I have, has it not come through for you? No. Let's go back and forward again. That's it. There we go. So these are just some of the pictures to give you an idea of what we are planting. Um, we're planting on the, the top left hand photograph is a photograph of uh, hawthorn flowers. We're planting over 3000 um, hawthorn plants in the park partly as hedgerows, but also in the back parts of the woodlands as thickets. And hawthorn is a, a really good source of nectar for bees around May time. Um, the top right hand photo is a photo of roses. So we're planting over 700 plants, and these are species roses. So this is actually a good example of the type of flowers that bees like, because if flowers are over cultivated, are actually no good for bees and pollinators because what we've done over the years is we've uh, hybridized plants so that we get so that we like them so they tend to be bigger more petals uh, different colors but that's not necessarily good for bees and pollinators so the flower on the top right hand corner is what we we would probably call a wild rose uh, these are great for bees and pollinators but when you're planting in your own garden try to think about planting for bees and pollinators. So roses, as in what we call hybrid teas and floribunda roses, aren't really good for bees or pollinators. So if you can plant plants that are less cultivated, as well as the cultivated ones, um, then that's much, much better for uh, bees and pollinators. So you can still plant your pansies and your roses, but try and plant something with bees and pollinators in mind, so that they, they have the food and the nectar and the pollen that they need. Um, in the middle photograph is of uh, a cherry tree and in one of the woodland quarters we're planting orchards which are particularly good for bees. So again you can see those small white flowers with lots of different uh, pollen and nectar. And the bottom right hand photograph is a photograph of the wildflower meadow which we've planted in one of the quarters. These are particularly good again for bees and pollinators. Because I don't, if you've been to Marble Hill over the last couple of months, you will have seen these beautiful swathes of wildflowers. And there were so many bees and pollinators in there, just walking through was wonderful. Um, the public are going to be able to walk in these areas, but we're going to try and keep uh, quite a lot of it as wildflower meadows. So you'll be able to sit there and see the different types of pollinators and bees that are buzzing around in those areas. And the top bottom left hand photograph is of our volunteers. So we are trying to manage the wildflower meadows in a traditional way. Our volunteers um, took part in a project to bring a whole load of hay over from Ham House to try and massively increase the plant species that we have in our meadows around the parkland. So we really are very much trying to increase the, the food sources for bees and pollinators as part of the project at Marble Hill. Um, next slide, please. Um, so other things we're going to be doing to um, help bees and pollinators is we won't, we're not going to be using pesticides in the woodland quarters, particularly pesticides that are bad for bees. Uh, and that is most pesticides, to be honest. We're going to be managing the meadows in traditional ways. So things are going to be the hay is going to be cut by hand. We're not going to be using machinery. We can help it, and we're just going to be trying to increase the number of flowers in those meadows and long grass areas for bees. Um, the woodlands have got quite a lot of habitat piles, which again is good for bees. So we're creating wood piles, twig piles. We're keeping as much of the rotten uh, wood and small twigs in there as we can. Uh, we're creating bee hotels as part of the project. And really the whole of the woodland areas and the park is going to be managed for maximum flowers. 
um, and fruit as well, which will be good once the bees have been in and pollinated the flowers. That in turn will be good for the birds. So these are part of the things that we're doing with the project to try and encourage and increase the bees in the park. Thank you. Fantastic. So now we've got our last poll here. And this one is all about this one you can have multiple answers to. So click as many as you like. And what, what space do you currently offer to support bees? Multiple choice. If you're lucky enough to have a garden or some kind of outside space, it doesn't have to be a garden, but in the smallest outside space, planting for bees in the garden, pots or window box, a bee hotel, an actual hive, or offering water, or something else we can do for bees. And you can take more than one answer and submit. Now let's see. Now a lot of people, um, more than four fifths, do planting for that's good for bees in the garden, which is great. And we need garden spaces make up a huge amount of that take up a huge amount of land in London. So garden planting is really important. And same with pots and window boxes as um, actual garden space may decline. And uh, half of the people here actually have a bee hotel and two thirds offer water, which is extremely important. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. So uh, if, if you're not already offering water, that is a really fantastic way to support bees. All you need is a, a small bowl with some rocks or stones in it and then fill with water so the bees can safely access the water. But the fact that you, you guys are already doing so much planting for them is already a really big support. So stop sharing that. Remember to click close so you can see the rest of it. Um, so then it's a case of how can you use your own space to help wildlife? So supporting bees is pretty similar to supporting most other types of wildlife. So letting the grass grow and leaving the, the dead wood, as Kate was saying about for, for the rotten wood, and letting flowers go to go to seed so there's an availability but that letting grass grow long is really important for that pollinators because we do have such fantastic wildflowers in our sort of mini meadow areas in our grassland areas building homes for insects and bats and birds and hedgehogs and also bees making the most out of small spaces so there are fantastic species that will be do really well in pots and containers that will help support our bees feeding the birds in the summer as well as the winter, which will help in the whole life cycle of all of these different wildlife things. They're all interacting. Choosing variety of insect friendly plants um, th that flower throughout the year. So it's not just the spring and summer flowering, but it's making sure we have flowers in the winter as well. So some people think ivy is a real nuisance, but actually winter flowering ivy is a real important source of nectar for our pollinators. And while we can avoid using chemicals like pesticides or weed killers, because they do have an impact on our bee species. And um, in Richmond, there is a biodiversity action plan and actually bees and pollinators is one of those key species. It's a, a species with an action plan to help support them as they are in such decline in our areas. And it says up here, and it was mentioned earlier, that domestic gardens as a whole account for nearly a quarter of all land in Greater London. So making those of our spaces are really, really important. Um, so now is a quick sort of how to, how you can build your own bee nursery. So you don't need big fancy things to be able to create this. Um, you can do it very simply with a bottle of water, uh, bo an old plastic bottle of water. Now all of us have, have moved away from these sort of single use plastics. You might have a few lying around your house still. So here's a good way to use the last couple that you might have left. So I'm going to play the video and I'll talk you through it a little bit. So the first thing you need to do is you need to cut your water bottle so it looks like this. So you cut off the top and you need to, there we go, I'm just showing you there. Cut off the top just like that and make a small slit in the bottom corner just down there. And it only needs to be a tiny slit just so you can get a piece of string. Now you want to take away any sharp edges. So just take some tape and tape it around the top of the bottle edge. So you'll probably need to do half at a time, tuck it over and then do the other half. And in true blue Peter style, there's one I had earlier. And then what you need to do is you need to take some string and it's a bit fiddly, but you need to poke it through that small little slit you made in the bottom. There we go. Make sure it goes through and then pull it through the other side 
and tie it together and that gives you a method of hanging up your lovely bee nursery. There we go. And then what you need to do is you need to get a load of sort of bamboo or garden canes and you need to make sure they're hollow all the way through because that's what's going to support the bees themselves. That's where they're going to go in to lay their eggs. You also want to make sure that it's slightly shorter than the bottle. So the bo bottle has an overhang. And if there is any bits in, you can just use a twig to poke it out and place it in. Then you want to keep doing that until it's really, really full. So you can't get any more bamboo in. And then you want to use some small twigs and bits of wood to really pack it in. So it's packed in really, really tightly. So this is that here. Oh, that one's a bit long, so that one will be taken out. So there you go. That's it packed in really tightly and nice and firm so it's all going to stay in place and then the twigs get put in to hold it and you want to be able to turn it upside down so it needs to be really really stable. Now you need to find a place to hang it. Now the best place is about a meter off the ground and ideally somewhere sunny and also somewhere definitely sheltered because this uh, bee hotel can get as cold as it like, the cold won't affect it, but the water really will. It'll be susceptible to a type of fungus if it does get wet. So you want to hang it at a slightly downwards angle for it to be able to be filled. And then you wait and you take a look. And if you remember back to the slides we were looking at earlier, you can actually see which ones have been used by what they've been sealed up by. So if you see one sealed up with chewed up leaves, then you know that it's probably a leaf cutter bee that has used it or mud, then it's most likely a type of mason bee and probably the most common red mason bee there. So now there's just a sort of a few reminders of how to do it. So you get your water bottle, you cut off the top, you put the tape round, you spread the string through, you pack it with twigs and canes, and you can even get some moss and put it at the bottom. So it's really, really secure, but make sure your moss is really dry, because as I said, you don't want to get it wet because then it will be susceptible to the fungus. And there we go, at least a meter off the ground, slightly slanting downwards, and hopefully your bee friends, your solitary bees, will come along and lay their their eggs in it. So that's it. I'll hand over to, to Rachel to do the, the final thanks. Rachel's on. Lovely. I'm on. unmuted. Hurrah! <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you for learning about um, our bees and also ways in which we can support uh, bees within our, um, within our community and the environment that we are custodians of. Um, there's lots of ways in which you can get involved in lots of things that are happening at, uh, at Marble Hill and lots of uh, things that we're doing with the Environment Trust. We've been lucky enough to be able to um, work with the Environment Trust with the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and But please remember that they are a, a charity just like English Heritage. So if you feel that you're able to, please do um, give generously to the Environment Trust and also to Marble Hill. Um, it costs £200,000 per year um, plus to be able to ensure that the, the park um, stays open. So uh, please do give generously if you can. Um, I will be sending around a, 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 an evaluation because it would be lovely to be able to share that with the Heritage Fund um, to uh, support the work that we're doing as part of the Marble Hill Revived. But we are so delighted that you've been able to, enjoy, to join us here today. Um, we've been really um, very blessed by the Environment Trust and their, um, their commitment to all that we're doing. Um, and we're, we, we're just very excited that you are part of this revival for now and going forward. Thank you so much for your time. Fantastic. And um, we have some questions coming through now. Um, so the first one, I saw bees going into some cyclamens in the garden. I didn't know they liked them. Didn't anyone want to have a comment on that? It's a sort of more of a statement, but uh, yeah, I don't know if, if Kate, you want to take yes. that? Bees will, bees will find the, the flowers that they like and, and cyclamen, as I said before, aren't over cultivated. So there's no reason why they shouldn't like it. It's just if, if um, flowers are over cultivated, they tend not to be the nectar that they, they're looking for. So there's no reason why they shouldn't like cyclamen, yeah. Fantastic. And um, someone's asked, can you drill holes in logs for bees? And if so, how deep? You absolutely can. Yep, yeah, that's a fantastic um, source of, of uh, nesting spot for bees. Um, and there's sort of no exact science to the depth. Really, the deeper, the better. Uh, 
about probably 15 centimeters deep roughly is a good amount so then they can get sort of a full brood laid in there both their females at the back and their males at the front and yet pop it somewhere um, nice and sheltered because again it will be the water damage or, or that fungus growth that will damage them and then just a few thank yous and how can we access the recording um so that will be sent out is that is that right rachel Yes, um, it hopefully will be hosted on the Marble Hill YouTube channel um, and there you can see lots of other things about not only our beehives and the um, wildflower meadow, but also some of the talks we've been doing with um, uh, with other organisations uh, with as part of the Twickenham luminaries, um, uh, sharing about the history um, of, our, of some of the amazing people within Twickenham um, and the heritage, uh, but also um, uh, some uh, information about what we're doing in the house um, and uh, our amazing curatorial team um, sharing about all the efforts that are going in to ensure that kind of uh, the experience that you're going to have when the house opens in 2022, um, the spring thereof, um, will be um, as exciting as we're, we're, um, we're sharing. Fantastic. And then there's a question. There are currently bees digging in the earth in a field behind our house but they don't look like minor bees could you perhaps tell us what they might be um do, if they sort of are leaving little volcano type little mounds they could be the the tawny mining bee um they could also be the ashy 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 mining bee apologies um they like to also dig in sort of the earth um, and they have sort of the gray strips around them but there's lots of different types of um mining bee either mason bees and things like that and which either dig in the earth or use pre-made holes so it's, it's difficult to see without seeing the holes but if they do have those little volcano shapes near them it's most likely going to be that the tawny mining bee but a really lovely id guide is actually on the friends of the earth um site they have some really nice illustrated pictures that can help you identify them if you do see them um da -da -da -da, a couple of questions a few thank yous that well thank you for joining us guys and um i didn't know there was a shop would have bought the honey i presume it's closed at the moment so any any where where else is there anywhere else they can get the honey no, yes. they can get the honey um, it's a local butchers in st margaret's armstrong's They're quite a well-known butchers um and he has the honey he has I've, I've taken him this week he's probably got about 50 pounds of it for sale up there so if they'd like to try some go up to armstrong's and, and you'll be able to get some this week there you go. That's great. Any more questions at all? Um, oh, just some thank yous. Uh, what flowers should I plant? I'm having the garden redone. Uh, Kate, did you want to take that? Um, I mean, I think really if you're having the garden redone, it was worth trying to, to think about planting as many native plants as you can. And if one fantastic thing you can plant is a native hedge. Mm. Um, and if you're having a hedge, so that would include things like Hawthorn, honeysuckle, um, privet is very good for pollinators. So it's a mixed hedge and it's a really good way of having all year round interest, but you're throwing lots and lots of different types of flowers at different times and, and those in turn will, will be, become berries for birds. So I think a native hedge, if there was one thing I would I'd, uh, 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 say is the best thing to plant, it would be a native hedge. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of flowers, you want to think about, as, as I mentioned earlier, sort of that year round flowering and ones that bees like. So things like cosmos and foxglove are really important because some uh, bees really like sort of the tubular shaped plants. Um, so there's plenty of um, information about sort of on websites or you can sort of send us an email and we can give you some more details. But just making sure you're thinking about year round planting. So all the way through from as early spring um, uh, throughout all the way through to winter as well um i have a blue beard they love that yes fantastic excellent there we go is there any more questions at all from anyone give a few more moments to frantically type anything lovely and if you do have any other questions please do get in touch and we will try and sort of help answer them and yeah, a few more thank yous. Well, thank you very much for joining. And I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your Monday and the, the sun's come out for us. So that's that's fantastic. <laughs>